Thank you very much for that introduction, Deborah. Um, can everybody hear me fine? Because my voice doesn't can't tend to carry very well. And uh, I understand this is being filmed for FCTV as well. Um, there'll be a bloopers tape available from the cameraman after, <laughs> I'm sure, if, if I know her. <coughs> that is my wife, for some of those who don't know. Um, so, yeah, uh, it's great to see so many people out here, given how much there is going on in Falmouth, uh, just on a Thursday night. Um, so either you're very dedicated water stewards, or you're oyster lovers, or, or hopefully both. But uh, uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad to see so many familiar faces, too, out there. Um, so I'm going to learn how to use this. Scott, yeah. speak it to the mic. Yeah. I'm now is a good time to speak into the mic. Okay, <laughs> so um, here's a little overview of, of uh, what I'm going to discuss today. Uh, you know, we're all very familiar with what, how oysters look and particularly how they taste, but oysters have a whole un unseen world by most of us un in their in the water, and uh, particularly the ecosystem services that they, they perform. Um, I'll go over some public health and public policy issues that have, have been in the news lately, and um, how oysters figure into that. Throughout my slides, you'll see some uh, pictures of oyster farming, and I'll describe uh, in some ways how, how that's done and how it's evolved over the last uh, many decades. And then I'll conclude with a sort of a practical guide to harvesting and, and eating oysters. Uh, one of the things I want to point out that I'm not going to touch on, which would take up a whole nother evening lecture, is about oysters, reefs, uh, oyster restoration. That's a whole nother natural science that uh, I'm not going to get into today. And it's one I'm not an expert in. So this, this is a word that we probably, most of us are familiar with in this room, unless you're a guest, perhaps. So I'll, I'll, I'll assume that there are a few tourists uh, or, or family members that have been dragged along tonight. Um, eutrophication is, is the process whereby uh, we have far too much nitrogen seeping into our coastal ponds and creating a mess. To put it very simply. Um, what you see on the, left, on, on the left side here is what our coastal ponds used to look like uh, 100 years ago, um, where, where we had verdant sea, seagrass and eelgrass beds, um, all the associated organisms that we would see with those, like bay scallops teeming in our, bay, in our, in our coastal ponds, lots of uh, uh, shellfish bioturbating and keeping the sediments, and, uh, keeping the sediments ox, uh, oxidized and, and uh, not so mucky. Like we see now, on the right-hand side, this nitrogen um, has become sort of a nuisance in that it, it's producing this proliferation of primary productivity. You get lots of microalgae, phytoplankton, little microcells of algae growing. You also get lots of seaweed proliferating, also the primary productivity. And those seaweeds uh, will suffocate the bottoms of our coastal, bay, coastal bays and, and estuaries. Um, so you get these algal, algal mats that are, that are uh, uh, accumulating. So um, this is a, a, a problem that we're facing here Cape Cod-wide. Uh, the, the towns are all wrestling with how to, uh, how to approach this. And it's going to be a, a, probably a suite of many different solutions. Um, and perhaps shellfish are one of them. Um, this graph is, is, a, is kind of a, this graphic is kind of funny to me because it, uh, it takes uh, a, a common plan and makes it look uh, utilitarian. But shellfish really are amazing vacuum cleaners or filters of water. And um, I'm going to demonstrate that in, in a, next, a little while. Um, but I don't want to overstate just what their role can be, too, because uh, they, they uh, are an important part of the solution, but they Clean, clean, clearly, in some locations, are not going to be the only solution. Um, so let me draw for you, uh, explain what are the three major ways that oysters remove nitrogen from our ecosystems or from our coastal ponds. As I said, said the nitrogen is seeping into the water through groundwater and through <laughs> atmospheric deposition, all human-derived nitrogen sources. Um, we're, we're the cause, there's no doubt about it, and we have to be part of the solution. They're producing all this phytoplankton that, that are growing off the nitrogen. And the, fil and the filter feeders, like oysters, are filtering it out. They're eating the, the phytoplankton, turning it into their tissues, and excreting a fair bit of it too, both as feces and as pseudo feces. So these biodeposits are going to the uh, seafloor bottom. And as they do, 
they first, many of them just get buried in the sediments and they're not reactive. Um, they're taken out of the system, at least temporarily, until the next storm maybe sweeps them up again. But in the meantime, they're buried. And the second way is it, uh, a lot of those pseudo-feces and feces become uh, basically substrata or um, they become food for microbes that have a, a process of turning it into nitrogen gas, harmless nitrogen gas that just bubbles up out of the sediments and in, back into the air. So that's a great short circuit, but it's, it's not taking care of all of the nitrogen, certainly. Probably the most of the nitrogen that shellfish are removing is basically in their bodies, sequestered in the tissues and the shells. Nitrogen, as you probably remember from your chemistry class, are the, are the build building blocks for proteins. And so proteins that go into building tissues and, sh and, and uh, gel are being sequestered in, in the oysters. So each time that Number three here, they were harvesting oysters, we're removing nitrogen. And on average here on Cape Cod, it's about 0.3 grams of nitrogen per oyster. So what does that mean? You know, most of us can't measure a 0.3 grams. Well, put this in perspective, uh, each year, each of us are producing about 5,500 grams of nitrogen into our water systems as excreta. Um, it takes about 18,000 oysters to, to cycle or to filter and take that nitrogen out of the water. So you can sort of see that we're, we still outnumber oysters quite <coughs> clearly um, in, in those kind of scopes. Um, so besides the, the direct or rather indirect nature that oysters are removing nitrogen from the ecosystems, um, they're also performing a variety of other ecosystem services. Uh, and that's particularly true when they're in, in culture here. Um, so carbon is deposited in the shells, uh, just quite naturally, and it's sequestered for, for a long, long time. We can consider that carbon sequestration, which is an important uh, uh, aim for society right now with ocean acidification and the like. Oysters and aquaculture gear, just by their nature of creating sort of 3D structure in the water, they're providing habitat for a diverse assortment of juvenile fish and invertebrates. Um, this, so it's an important nursery ecosystem function they're, they're, they're performing. In fact, studies have shown, you know, many of these coastal bays and ponds don't have eelgrass. Well, guess what? Within the, eel, within the aquaculture gear itself, there's almost as much diversity of organisms and, and juvenile critters as there was in the eelgrass. So, Oyster aquaculture is performing a, an important function that um, has been lost. Cultured oysters um, are releasing larvae into the environment continually, so they're helping to replenish natural fisheries. And finally, filter feeding, a very important function of oysters and shellfish in general, they're clearing the water <coughs> continually, and they're providing more light penetration so that when eelgrass conditions are right, eelgrass has a chance <coughs> to clear. otherwise they'd be shaded by all the phytoplankton that would otherwise grow. Um, so th this was produced locally by Elise Hugus and Dan, uh, her partner, and cameraman. Um, and what we're about to see is uh, some time-lapse photography of oysters filtering the water. These are several dozen oysters that uh, we've grown here at the MBL. Um, I talked about these little aquatic engineers and how efficient they are at filtering the water. And so this is some algae that we grew here at the MBL, but these are naturally available. And there, that's a good meal for these guys. And I calculate that in this five gallon aquarium, with this many oysters in here, that the oysters should be able to filter the algae out of the water and make it virtually clear in the course of about two to three, maybe four hours at the most. I recommend this, this, this film, that it's called The Watershed, and if you go to the APCC's website, um, you'll see the range of uh, impacts that shellfish um, culture in particular has on uh, our waters in Cape Cod. So what are, what, what are all those ecosystem services worth? Well, the, the East Coast Shellfish Growers Association um, did some back-of-the-envelope calculations, and, and uh, for nitrogen removal, for instance, 
Um, there's a pretty wide variance of how you could value this. It really depends on whether these are oysters that are somehow replacing what costs you might otherwise spend on sewering um, to just the, the nitrogen value um, at, a, at the low end. So three to $67 million. Habitat improvement, as I said, that's an important uh, role that oysters can have in uh, producing habitat for other critters, $150 million. Turbidity removal, better water quality, very hard to value. Shoreline stabilization, also hard to value. Carbon credits from that carbon sequestration, still tough to value. Larval production for wild shell fisheries, also important. But the bottom line is that the value of the ecosystem services alone may equal or exceed the value of the harvest of the oysters themselves. So it's not to be uh, underrated. So um, I'm going to raise three sort of public policy and in this case, public health issues that have been sort of in the news lately. Um, the number of reported illnesses in Massachusetts related to oyster consumption increased from two in, in 2011 to 33 in 2013. And that really, really raised a lot of uh, alarm bells. Um, this was principally due to a bacterium called Vibrio, Vibrio paralytica, para, <laughs> paralytica, para, para. Parahemolyticus. Thank you, parahemolyticus. <laughs> Um, glad we got such an erudite audience here to correct me. Uh, and so the industry and the, the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries and Public Health jumped on this, and to their credit, whoa, what did I just do? There we go. Jumped on it and um, started to employ some very strict uh, harvesting guidelines, particularly in the warmer summer months. And now all oysters have to be cooled to less than 50 degrees within a few hours of harvest. And uh, consequently, the number of illnesses reported in 2014 have only been 11. Now, keep in mind, this is 30 million oysters that are being consumed. So it's really a drop in the bucket. In fact, you're still much safer eating oysters than chicken or beef, frankly. Um, I'm going to show a few slides here of just some of the typical ways that oysters are grown and how it's evolved. Um, you know, the first oyster growing were, were uh, and the oldest type of, is, is growing these on intertidal uh, flats. So cages and racks and bags are set up like this. And it's very convenient for the oyster farmer because uh, the oyster bags uh, and the racks are constantly being uh, cleared of fouling simply by being exposed to air and sunshine. So the oyster farmer isn't continually trying to clean gear which is what happens when, water, when stuff is in the water all the time. It's also convenient, much more convenient for working on because they, they don't have to use boats and they can, uh, in some places, actually pull out uh, uh, their, their trucks and, and get to work on them. Uh, here's a picture, a little fuzzy, of uh, me working with uh, uh, an oyster farmer in Wellfleet who's helped me do some of our, our disease-resistant uh, oyster studies. And it's Sarah Peak, our representative in, in the middle there. This is sort of a, some innovative gear that's being used in the, the, the tidal flats in Province to, uh, Turo, actually. Um, it's floating oyster grow gear, and again, you can put more, more uh, uh, bags in these multi-tiered cages that typically float uh, upside down in the water when, uh, the, when the tide is up and uh, uh, are exposed at low tide for cleaning the gear. But, there are fewer and fewer permissible intertidal spaces to farm oysters. It's, it's, you know, you've got all sorts of other users and potential public conflict when you're in those intertidal areas. So uh, there's been more and more of a push to subtidal farming. And most, most of the typical subtidal farming is in, still in protected and in these enclosed basements. Like this is a picture of uh, the farm in Wakoit Bay and the Seafit River um, with some of their floating gear. Again, it's gear that can be flipped such that uh, when it's, uh, the gear starts getting fouled, the, the bag's going to be exposed in the air and the sun for a few hours. This is a pond in Bourne um, with floating bags of oysters. Uh, this is similar to the kind of uh, way that oysters are being grown in Little Pond as well, as we'll see later. A um, little bit more of a visual obtrusion if, if you're uh, averse to seeing this kind of thing. 
But again, it's very convenient for the farmer because he can just flip these bags. They're just single bags that can be flipped uh, when the fouling starts to occlude the water flow and, and uh, potential algae being distributed in food to the, to the oysters. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> this, this is a subtidal farm in Long Island Sound off of Fisher's Island um, where the gear is continually uh, sunk. And farms like this uh, in, in Long Island Sound and also in Narragansett Bay um, don't have the virtue of being able to dry their gear except to pull it ashore. And here's an example of what, uh, you can probably can't really see this very well, but the, the gear on the right hand side is clear and you can see the, the, the patch, the, 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 the uh, mesh of the cage. The gear on the right hand side is just totally occluded by mussels. And uh, these mussel sets and barnacle sets and tunicate sets can happen at any, you know, very quickly. And uh, if you don't get on top of it and pull that gear out of the water and clean it, um, your oysters will severely suffer and perhaps suffocate. So um, this is a, a picture out in some very exposed waters off of Provincetown and Truro, about a mile off. There's a 50-acre site that's just been developed. And uh, there they point them out, but there are, there are floating cages dotted along here. Um, as I say, more and more exposed. And, and this is the way that aquaculture is evolving. The, the, even the subtital protected areas now are, are, are few and far between. So now farms that want to expand are, are moving offshore. And this leads us to sort of policy conundrum that uh, number two that I'm going to discuss, um, which is how do you permit aquaculture structures in the ocean? Um, for a long time, three of these, there's sort of three basic statues that you have to meet. One, um, you can't interfere with navigation. So you have to have things well marked, and it can't be where, where traffic is commonly going, and, or you need to make a, a clear pathway through it for, for uh, um, recreational or boating traffic. It can't interfere with traditional fisheries. Um, traditional fisheries have been around longer than aquaculture. They scream really loudly if, they're, if, they, if they feel like they're, uh, you know, what they're living is possibly going to be um, constrained. And uh, the Division of Marine Fisheries is, is a strong advocate to make sure that they have um, the access that they have always had. So you have to pick spots that uh, aren't going to conflict with those fisheries. And the new one that, that, that's unique, not just unique to aquaculture, because it's a problem with fisheries too, but aquaculture is sort of being held to a higher standard, and that is that it can't pose a risk to protected species. So when you put gear out in the open ocean, you're putting out lines, you're putting out buoy markers, um, things that look to regulators and fishery specialists an awful lot like the lobster buoys and the conch trap buoys that entangle turtles sometimes. So um, I'm working, because I, I also chair the shellfish advisory committee up in Truro, um, I'm working with Truro fish, shellfish, shellfish farmers and the Center for Coastal Studies, which are experts in disentanglement, to uh, develop special lines that won't get tangled um, with turtles and uh, testing them for their, their feasibility in, in those waters. So um, I showed you some, some typical pictures of uh, oyster aquaculture that's done privately. I want to talk just very briefly about municipal oyster projects. And I'm going to touch upon Falmouth's Little Pond Oyster Project and the oyster nursery they're, going, they're, they're, they're using there. Fortunately, if I misstate anything, we have the expert here, Sia Karplis, um, <laughs> who's been managing and helping the town manage the, this project for some time. So um, at the end, she'll probably correct me if, uh, if I misstate anything. But here's a, a, a nice picture I took of the, uh, the floating bag uh, structures in, in Little Pond. Um, I think in last year, they planted uh, a million and a quarter or so. This year, the, the goal is two million, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they have over 700 bags uh, where they grow the oysters just from seed, which is about sits on a four millimeter mesh um, <coughs> to about a one to one and a half inch size over the course of the first growing season. Um, so from about now, July <coughs> through October. 
Now, because these waters are closed, they can't grow them all the way to market size. They have to be, by state mandate, they have to be transferred to waters that are considered open or uncontaminated, like a little pond, um, which is a great benefit to the townspeople of Falmouth because they go into West Falmouth Harbor, they go into Green Pond, Bourne's Pond, and then the areas that they're planted, they're closed for a while until they depurate and they grow bigger, and then they're opened up to the townspeople to, to collect and, and harvest. The town also has, uh, besides the expense of operating this uh, nursery um, with the nursery bags and little pond, they also have some expense associated with raising the seed as well that they get from hatcheries in, in upwellers like this. Like you, this is not the one you see um, at Falmouth Harbor, but it's similar. Um, in comparison, Mashpee also runs a, a, an oyster um, program for water uh, improvement. Um, it's in the Mashpee River, and they, they've been doing this for about 10 years, and they use a very different system. Um, I think both systems have pros and cons, and you'll, you'll be able to make your own evaluation when you see some of the results here. So they use um, these trays in the shallow waters. Uh, these trays are about 5 foot wide and 10 foot long. Um, they buy what's called remote set seed from the hatchery, which is generally much cheaper than the, the single seed that... Uh, um, you get from the hatchery and then have to then spend more time and energy to grow in, a, in an upweller. And they plant them in these trays uh, and they don't, they, they have to manage them for predators a bit and for some fouling, but they don't ever move them again. They just let them sit there and grow and uh, uh, when they're ready to harvest, they invite the public to come down and, and harvest them. So these are the spats are the example of the spat on shell bags that would be broken open and spread into those trays. Um, this is an example of some stuff we grew at the MBL. Um, so I'm going to talk just a little bit now about how oysters might, might figure into water quality management schemes that the towns are, are showing as demonstration projects right now. I'm going to try to answer these three questions. How, how effective is it? How much does it cost? And can it be done by public-private partnerships that might even reduce the cost lower? This last question is a little bit controversial. Some towns are, are, are getting to explore this, but quite frankly, it, it's a state-town negotiation that needs to happen if this is ever going to happen. So how effective is it? Um, let's, let's take note first that an impacted watershed like Little Pond requires removal of a considerable amount of nitrogen, 11,000 pounds per year. On the two acres, Little Pond Oyster Nursery, because these are such small oysters when they're moved out, they're only removing about 185 pounds of nitrogen. That's assuming this is, this, I did this on a, on a million and a quarter oysters. I know C is going to challenge this, but that's just the, the small oysters, um, about a million oysters or so that are moved out. Um, once those oysters are planted and harvested, that's where the real nitrogen removal happens. Um, so if those million oysters get moved over to Green Pond and West Falmouth, when they're harvested, they're moving about 528 pounds of nitrogen. The Mashpee program, um, it's much denser because of those trays being so packed with oysters, uh, and they can put them side by side. They're removing uh, about 264 to 422 pounds of nitrogen per acre. But all of these programs, you can see, when you've got 11,000 pounds of nitrogen, um, you need to have many acres of oysters. And Little Pond is only 40 acres, so uh, you'd have to fill it, and you could still perhaps only remove a third to a half of the nitrogen. So how much does it cost? Um, let's look at the floating nursery, plant to the bottom scenario that Falmouth um, is doing. If you just take a look at the, the Little Pond part, it's about 540 pounds, I figure, per dollar, I'm sorry, 540 dollars per pound of nitrogen um, removed from Little Pond. Once you, if you can plant these, if you can plant these and then harvest them, um, the remainder of the nitrogen is getting removed at about 189 dollars per pound. The Mashpee system, because it's much less labor intensive, um, and it's all done in one place. It's lower cost still, about 128 
So two hundred five dollars per pound of nitrogen removed. Uh, that's the statin shell system. Um, so you have to also consider some other differences between these two programs, and that is, what are the direct community benefits? So this may also be lowball by C's estimate, but once you've planted those single oysters, they yield a revenue to commercial and recreational harvesters of about $200,000, maybe more. Again, it depends on whether you're planting a million or two million, um, and how much, what the survival is over the winter, which can, can change from year to year. But it's still something in the taxpayers' pockets that uh, uh, for a program that, that, that might cost a hundred to hundred to two hundred thousand dollars a year to run. Mashpee, on the other hand, um, they only have a recreational harvest coming out of their uh, oyster program. Because their oysters are all clumped and stuck together, um, they have a relatively low value. So they're, they're valuable to the, to the people who collect them uh, and go out and get them, but they don't really have a commercial value. Well, now let's compare what conventional wastewater treatment it costs compared to the numbers that I just gave you. So on the bottom are the numbers I, I just um, described for nitrogen bioextraction of oysters. If we were just to fix up each of our individual septic systems with the most innovative nitrogen removing technologies, it's very <laughs> much higher. A low of 540 to high base case of $920 per pound of nitrogen removed. There are cluster systems, you know, which you might use in neighborhoods and satellite systems, and then the, the, the big mother of them all, the centralized systems. Um, you begin to, to approach uh, the cost of removal that oysters, um, uh, the cost of removal per pound that oysters do with centralized systems, but we all know how, how expensive those can be to implement um, system-wide. So oysters look pretty favorable in this uh, light, but remember again, I, I mentioned just how scarce available areas are for growing oysters given all the constraints from abutters, stakeholders, recreational users. Um, this has to be done on a very careful basis with a discussion community-wide in order to uh, expand oyster aquaculture. So, you know, one question we need to ask is um, can we can we <laughs> can we get uh, more bang for our buck in terms of spending money on oyster aquaculture? Should it all be done municipally in those those closed waters that are most impacted, or could we find some partnership with private entities so that um, the private entities bear the cost but also bear some of the uh, uh, rewards? Um, for instance, one could imagine that. Uh, if the Little Pond project were taken over by a private entity, managed by the town, so that the town would take care of any, all the auditing to make sure what was went in and what came out, um, the private entity might want to take some of those oysters and plant them on their farm in compensation for uh, the nursery extraction process in Little Pond. They might still plant some, half of them in, in West Falmouth Harbor and, and uh, in Bourne's Pond for, for uh, townspeople to, to enjoy as well. But they, they would have a business um, interest in making sure that the whole program worked well. But this raises a bunch of sticky regulatory questions that I, I mentioned would have to be negotiated between the state and the town. Because right now, only towns are allowed to propagate shellfish in these closed waters, like the Little Pond, um, or, the, or the headwaters of uh, of Green Pond and, and Great Pond, where, which are also closed, and where nitrogen is most uh, clearly impacting them. Private entities, private farmers, are only, by the state law, only allowed to open up, uh, grow in certified open waters. Um, so, as I mentioned, towns are beginning to approach the state and, and try to see ways that they might be able to have partnerships um, with private entities that would uh, uh, in, in some of these borderline waters that are that are closed in the summer but open in the winter for harvest, um, this could save tax dollars, reduce sewering costs, perhaps um, promote business and clean up the waters at the same time. 
So in closing, I'm going to give a quick snapshot about the East Coast shellfish industry. Um, currently it's comprised of about a thousand small farms. Only about 30 have more than 10 employees, so it's mostly really small uh, mom and pop operations. They generate about $120 million in sales, at least they did in 2012, this, that number has gone up. Um, about 11% of those sales are in Massachusetts, from Massachusetts farms rather. Here's a, a chart of the uh, primary Massachusetts oyster harvesting areas. You'll see that uh, the primary, three primary areas uh, in terms of volume of oysters produced would be Wellfleet, Barnstable, and Duxbury. Uh, three areas dotted around Cape Cod Bay in principle. Um, you'll see a black dot here uh, in Falmouth that comprises of a large farm in Wakoit Bay, but otherwise most of the farms here in Falmouth are quite small um, in Buzzards Bay. Quite remarkably, the number of cultured oysters and har that are harvested in Massachusetts each year have been increasing uh, and in fact tripled since 2007 um, to from 10 million to now about 30 million in, in the latest count in 2014. And finally, here's some advice about how to find oysters here in Falmouth and enjoy them. First, uh, you'll want to check the town website to make sure that there are open areas and what the times are that you can go collect oysters. Be sure to buy a shell fishing permit at Town Hall. When, you're, when you pick up your permit, you should also get the guide to town specific regulations uh, regarding when and where and what size oysters or shellfish, clams, scallops, etc. you might want to collect. Be sure to take a measuring device. Um, oysters need to be a three inch minimum length. And finally, you ought to learn how to shuck an oyster because they're really the best when they're fresh and live. Here's a little wooden device that I like for opening my oysters. Um, you can find these on the web. Uh, it holds the oyster quite steadily while you put the knife in. You just want to cut the hinge at the very tip there um, and bring the knife along the top edge of the top shell cut the muscle away and then you're left with your half shell and the meat inside the oyster shell there. Also want to cut the muscle away from the bottom shell. I usually flip it over just so I know that it's going to come sliding out easily when somebody wants to eat it. All right, here we go, the best part. Yum, those are perfect oysters. <laughs>